My name is David Cobb, and I am a pissed off American. And I am, I am very serious about that. I am angry because the America that I was promised as a little boy is not the America that I am experiencing today. You know, I, look, I remember genuinely, sincerely, growing up, how proud I was to be an American. Because I was taught and told as a little boy that my country was the land of the free and the home of the brave. That my country was the place of liberty and justice and equality. And I was so proud to be a people that valued those ideals. Of course, as a little boy, I didn't have the words to describe it that way. But at a gut level, even as a child, I knew what that meant. And I knew that it was a good thing and it was a noble thing. And as if that wasn't enough, I was taught that my country was going to bring those values to the rest of the world. Not only was my country a place of liberty and justice and equality, but my country was going to make sure that all the rest of the world could experience those values true. I was so proud to be an American. And when I grew up, I found out I had been lied to. And you know, I don't think that Mrs. Armstrong, my fifth grade teacher, intentionally lied to me in a deceitful sort of way. I think that she was confused herself. I think she had been lied to. But it wasn't only until I actually got to college that I really began to understand the depths of U.S. history and the genocidal policies of the settling of this country and what that meant and slavery and the role that it played in the building of this country or the way women had been treated throughout the overwhelming majority of the history of this country. And, you know, it makes me mad. And I'll tell you the truth, and I always like to scan the crowd just for the age of the group before I say this. I have been able to accept that there's not an Easter bunny. <laughs> I can get my head around no tooth fairy. And in the right circumstances, on the right day, Depending on how you approach me about it, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that maybe there's not a Santa Claus. But I'll be damned if I'm going to accept that this United States of America is not a democracy. That's one creation myth that I was told as a little boy that I want to make true. And so Ricky Ott and I have been traveling the country in order to try to do what we can to actually make that promise a reality. I think, I think we start the show. <laughs> We're going to actually start by the recent Supreme Court decision of Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. How many of you have actually heard of that case? A lot of hands go up, right? Yeah, boo is right. So it's interesting. Remember this, that most Supreme Court cases come and go. Nobody even remembers them, even when they're happening. Uh, and in fact, uh, over the course of time, only very few actually end up being really remembered. Roe versus Raid, uh, that recognized that a woman has bodily integrity during a pregnancy at least for three months, right? Uh, or Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court decision that finally overturned not just Jim Crow segregation laws, but a hundred years of other Supreme Court uh, decisions that had been dead wrong, right? But there are other cases that are remembered not for the positive, uh, but instead for the negative. Dred Scott the Supreme Court saying no black man has any rights that a white man is ever bound to uphold or respect. Minor versus Hepperset, the Supreme Court decision that said women are not persons for the purposes of the 14th Amendment and have no equal protection uh, uh, claims against law states that forbid them from voting. I believe Citizens United is going to go down in history like Dred Scott went down in history. And you know what, folks? Yeah, you can applaud that. And I'll say, I'll go one step further. As horrific as that case is, and we'll talk about that in a moment, I welcome the clarity. Let's talk about what this case is really about. In a nutshell, the decision overturns the McCain-Feingold campaign finance laws. Now remember this. Come on in, y'all. Just on time. <laughs> step over the cord, and you can make it around and find a spot. This decision overturns McCain-Feingold. Now, McCain-Feingold the, was the campaign finance laws that had been passed by John McCain and Russ Feingold, uh, Democrat and Republican in Congress, 
uh, that, di that uh, had some levels of control and limits on campaign finance expenditures in federal elections. Now, even with those flimsy laws in place, about $5 billion, with a B, $5 billion was spent in the 2008 election cycle. And of course, we know that that was money spent mostly on 30-second advertisement. No real political discourse or debate. Nothing really came of that, from my opinion. Let's just stop for a moment and imagine how many schools might have been built with $5 billion in the United States? How much health care might have been available to sick people? What kind of investment might we have engaged in transitioning off of coal and oil and on to solar and wind and geothermal sustainable energy practices? I submit to you $5 billion in one election cycle is a hell of a lot of money for Americans to spend and not actually get anything out of it. And that $5 billion was spent under McCain-Feingold. McCain-Feingold overturned, uh, Citizens United overturned McCain-Feingold, and not only that, it actually overturns or sets the stage by which 24 other state laws are going to be overturned. Now, I've written that they're in jeopardy of being overturned. They're in jeopardy to the extent that as soon as a corporate lawyer goes into court in those 24 states, those laws will be overturned. In a nutshell, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission legalizes corporate bribery. It legalizes corporate extortion. How? It says that a corporation is entitled to spend unlimited amounts of money in elections in order to influence voters when they go to the polls. The only thing that a corporation cannot do is make a direct contribution to a candidate. However, a corporation can literally spend unlimited amounts of money out of their own uh, corporate char out of their own coffers in order to influence an election. And for example, if Ricky Ott is running for United States Congress, uh, let, let, let's say she's actually a sitting member of the U.S. Congress. I now, as the Chamber of Commerce, can go to Ricky Ott and say, "Please come in." Uh, this way is probably best. I can, I can come in to her office and say, Ms. Ott, I understand that you are proposing legislation to protect workers. Well, that's all fine and good, but if you would, I don't like the bill that you've currently introduced. Now, we have one of two choices. Either you sit down with me, the Chamber of Commerce, and allow me to help you draft that legislation such that it is acceptable to me, or... I will spend $500,000 against you. I'll spend a million dollars against you. I'll spend two million dollars against you. I'll spend three million dollars against you. Five million dollars against you. See, I get to see, keep upping the number until her eyes get big. The point is that it has given the corporate elite a very clear mechanism by which they can literally extort elected officials. Before the Citizens United case, that conversation would have been illegal. Not just under campaign finance laws, that could have arguably been actually prosecuted as a criminal violation. And today it's completely illegal. That's the U.S. Supreme Court today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> McDonald's and Shell and Mo uh, there's Exxon and Mobile uh, together. I really think that that's what we're dealing with. So, and what I think is important to understand that this is the most recent and blatant example of the U.S. Supreme Court using the rationale of corporate personhood in order to reach a determination. Many of you have heard that there have been prior cases, and there certainly have been many cases where the Supreme Court based its decision on corporate personhood or corporate constitutional rights. This is the most explicit example of that ever happening, and it is, of course, the most recent one. It is the reason that so many people are spitting mad. Let's do a quick definition of democracy. And for those of you who are taking this for credit, how about a little pop quiz? What's the definition of democracy? Anybody? One man, one vote. One man, one vote is a, that, that's a portion of it. Thank you very much. Rule of the people. I'd say that goes a little deeper. And if we go from the Greek where the word comes from, demos means people or the people. Kratia means power. Literally, the people rule. Rule of the people. That's what democracy means. 
Now let me ask you something. How many people in this room believe that you are living in a functioning democracy where the people really rule? Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Right? Nobody really believes that. And by the way, it doesn't matter what your political ideology is. Like principled conservatives, liberals, radicals, moderates, nobody really honestly argues anymore that we live in a functioning democracy in the United States of America. Now, let that sink in for a moment. That is a very big deal. So, what I'm going to do now is my very best effort to, in a very short period of time, give a framework for the United States constitutional framework. How it is that our country is supposed to operate. Because the U.S. Constitution, of course, is the supreme law of the land. That's what we're taught in civics class, or at least I was fortunate enough to still be taught civics. I look out and I'm, I'm not even sure anymore today you know, how, how much civics is actually taught in public education. But the Supreme Court is, or the, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. In that document, there are basically two entities described, we the people and government. It's important to note that the word corporation never appears in the U.S. Constitution. The people or person appears 34 times. Might suggest to us that the founders, for all their faults, and they definitely had many, but for all their faults, they never expected the corporation to play any meaningful role in the body politic. After all, if they expected the corporation to be actively engaged uh, in government, they would have actually described and mentioned the corporation in the document that creates the government, right? We, the people in that document, are described as being free and sovereign. Government is described as being subordinate and accountable. Subordinate to whom? The people. Accountable to whom? I like that. It's got a ring to it. We, the people, are described as having our individual rights. Government is described as having collective duties. In fact, under this constitutional framework, at least as it's supposed to work, all legitimate power is held by the people. The people then delegate a certain amount of that power and only enough to do the duties that they have been assigned to perform. In fact, under Western concepts of law, the interchange between rights and duties is the very foundation of the law. And to be clear, if I have a right to do something, it means I can do it even if all the rest of you don't like it. I don't need the permission of other people or of government to do it if I have a right to do something. Likewise, if I have a duty to you, sir, it means that I have to do it, even if I don't want to do it. And if I don't do it, you can compel me to do it. And if you need to, you can actually get the rest of social institutions, like the police or the courts, to inter intervene and compel me to act. That's the difference between a right and a duty. That is a very important distinction. We, the people, when we're operating as free and sovereign people with our individual rights, this is where we're in our private sphere. When we are operating in, our, uh, it, in the public sphere is government, where we have all of us actually have to figure out uh, interacting together. And I look at this and I think, this is brilliant. I love this. We should try that in this country. I think it would work. And I'm totally serious about that on two levels. One, it is brilliant. And I'll tell you what I really love about it is number one, it satisfies my civil libertarian impulses, my don't tread on me kind of idea that when I'm acting as a free and sovereign citizen, I don't need the rest of anybody's permission to act. I have the right to think what I want to think, to say what I want to think. I have certain rights that all the rest of you, even acting governmentally, cannot interfere with. But it doesn't stop there because this concept understands that no person is an island, that in fact we do operate in a public setting. It, so my communitarian sensibilities are also satisfied by this document because it realizes when acting within the public uh, entity that, the, the, that governmental structures uh, are in place for us to actually collectively make decisions and implement them. Man, I like this very, very much. But before I go one step 
further and waxing poetic about the U.S. Constitution and how great it is, here's another pop quiz for you. What date was the Constitution either proposed, uh, written, or ratified? I'll take any date. A year. 1787 and 1789. So, I know, you're so close. But they, that's when they were meeting, actually. So you get, you get full credit. You get full credit. That's when they were meeting in Philadelphia. So, in 1786, 1787, 1789, who were the people that got to claim this brilliant, beautiful document? White men. White and men. Property owners. Rich property owners. <laughs> <laughs> There's another thing people often forget. You had to be in the right religion. Right? You could be a rich white man with property and you, and you still, yeah. You still had to be in the right religion before you could even exercise that. Uh, and so if we count, and, and that doesn't even mention children, right? But of the adult population in the area known as the 13 colonies, does anybody know in 1787 what percentage of the adult population actually could claim to be legally persons under law under this framework? 20 is high. It's very high. Seven to eight percent. Think about it. Seven to eight percent of the adults uh, that could claim this framework that we're taught as the framework for the United States. Um, and of course, no less a noted figure than the, the late great Howard Zinn observed, in one respect, the entire history of the United States can be looked at as a series of pitch struggles by human beings to define themselves legally as persons under the Constitution. And so, in a very real way, the U.S., the founding of the United States government under this constitutional framework is a founding violence. It's a founding violence, obviously, against the indigenous people who lived here first. And by the way, it wasn't discovered, right? There were people living here. They were not lost. <laughs> so it's a founding violence against the indigenous who were subjected to genocidal policies. It's obviously a founding violence against the Africans who were brought in chains as slaves to, and forced to build most of the infrastructure of this country. It's a founding violence against the women who could not actually, not only could they not vote, they couldn't own property or enter into contracts. In fact, they literally legally were chattel property themselves. Their legal existence only existed to the extent that they had relationship with their fathers or their husbands or their brothers or their uncles or some man in their life, right? I mean, so I don't want to get all wrapped up in how great the constitutional framework is without really acknowledging the history uh, of where that document comes out of. But I also want to understand and point out that the creation myth that we're taught about this, we're taught for a reason. Because if you take it out of the historical context and just look at the principles and the values and the concepts that are here, it's beautiful. That's why they teach us this creation myth so that we'll be proud of being Americans, right? And so what I'm saying is I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say where we're from. There's a baby here, you know, and it's beautiful. And these concepts of civil libertarianism and communitarian actions, and uh, that's a beautiful thing, and we need to, co we need to hold on to that. And the, before I, I go to the next one, I really want to underscore the difference between private and public and why individual rights are so important. Because it means that individual rights are so sacrosanct. And by the way, the Constitution doesn't create rights, it recognizes rights inherent and alienable human rights. Which is to say that rights that are inherent to the extent that even if governmental action attempts to interfere and encroach upon my legitimate, inherent, individual rights, the governmental action is illegitimate by definition. For example, laws that codified slavery, even though they had gone through a process of state legislatures enacting those laws, those laws were illegitimate by definition under this framework. Laws preventing women from voting, 
even though they had gone through a democratic process in each of those states, were illegitimate intellectually under that framework because they violated the rights of women. Laws that codified uh, criminals uh, or trade unionists as criminals and trade unions literally as criminal conspiracies, those laws were illegitimate even though they had gone through a democratic process because they violated the workers' inherent rights to freedom of association. And I submit to you today, if I, David Cobb, wants to marry a man, if the state of Washington purports that they are going to forbid me from doing so, that law is illegitimate because I have the right to choose who I want to marry. And that's the kind of thinking that we need to get into, not just on, on gender issues or marriage issues, but we have to understand inherent human rights must be protected and must be fought but in the public sphere, there is still a way at which the democratic state must operate. So, some folks might say, all right, Cobb, you got yourself a point there. Maybe originally there was a problem, but, but today we've gotten rid of slavery and women can vote. So chill out, calm down, it all works. The problem is, of course, corporations. Corporations, by the way, which are created by state government through a charter because it is it requires the state government to issue that charter because it's a privilege, not a right, to get limited liability. That charter can describe the duties, in fact, once did, 75, first 75 years of this country, uh, that every charter actually required that the charter would dissolve after 10 or 20 years, at which point you had to reapply all over again. They had very strict restrictions on what a corporation could do or could not do. And get this, every corporation had to act within the public interest or their corporate charter was going to be revoked and could be revoked. Do you see how tightly the corporation was controlled at one time under law? And I just want to say that to really make it clear that our call to control corporations like this is not a radical new idea. It's radical in the sense that it's systemic, but it's actually a return to what this country had in its founding and for the first 75 years. But in corporations properly understood is a public entity. Because if this line is important, if I'm right about that, and I am, it is very important that we the people be able to control the institutions that are actually shaping our country. So when the United States Supreme Court, an unelected and virtually unaccountable body, says corporations are not on this side, but on this side of the line with inherent human rights, we got a problem. The Supreme Court has virtually eliminated our ability to have a functioning democratic republic. Because folks, when the United States Supreme Court says that corporations can legally claim the constitutional rights of a person, democracy itself is illegal. And that's why the effort that Ricky and I are involved with and what we're encouraging you to get involved with is called the campaign to legalize democracy. Now we're going to come back to questions over this, but for right now, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Ricky Ott. Ricky? Thank you, David. been working with uh, students on a lot of campuses and one of the I think the seminal issue for students now in time is the issue of the climate crisis um, forget global warming forget climate change I mean this is a full-on meltdown of our climate um, and a lot of the students are chanting no coal no oil no compromise and I ask how are you going to get to no compromise you know this is something that we really need to think about. Um, oops, I didn't change this from last night. This is me when I was 13. Uh, that, but my father here is the mentor. Uh, OK, this is a pop quiz. So Wisconsin, 1967, 68, Robin's falling out of the trees, dying. Why? DDT. DDT. Yeah. And uh, my father sued the state of Wisconsin over DDT. And it was, yeah, we had, wow. yeah. <laughs> and, and dad prevailed, and uh, so I, I came out of that with two mentors, Rachel Carson, you know, Silent Spring, and my father. And the lesson was when something happens in, to you in your backyard, you don't say, oh, and turn your back on it. You step up, right? You step up, you fix the problem that's in front of you. That was the lesson from my dad. So when this happened, 
um, in my backyard in Prince William Sound on March 24th, 1989. I mean, what popped into my head was, I know enough to make a difference. Do I care enough? And I had gotten a master's, and uh, actually my doctorate came from the University of Washington here, School of Fisheries. Um, so what you're looking at is about 30 million gallons of oil um, in Prince William Sound. This is not, you know, Exxon's figure, 11 million gallons uh, is their unverified figure. But really what you're looking at here is the most profitable tanker voyage anywhere on the planet because this tanker voyage generated $2.5 billion of economic activity in a cleanup the summer of 1989. That boosted the entire gross domestic product for the state of Alaska single-handedly was this cleanup. So really the way we currently measure economic growth and wealth and health across the country, oil spills are actually good for, the, for, for us, especially ones that generate all this cleanup activity. That's how this was measured. And when I went to, to uh, the state legislature the subsequent three years and tried to get increased oil spill prevention and response measures, I was literally told by legislators, why should I listen to you? My constituents made money on this spill. And they were serious. Okay, so the question we began to frame in our heads in Cordova, and I'm going to put this in perspective, is that David kind of did the deconstruction of the myth that we have a democracy, and I'm going to do the reconstruction, but I'm doing it from a community perspective where we had a disaster, and we as a people, I mean, I'm not saying activists, I'm saying fisher people, native people, we had to grapple with the fact that a big corporation can come in and trash our environment, um, trash our lives, trash our economy, and get away with it. This is what's on our beaches still to this day. I take high school students out, dig a pit about this deep. The surrounding beach rock is so porous that the oil flows from laterally into the pit, rises to the surface. Right. So if your beaches look like this in Puget Sound, they would, there would be people doing something about it, and there would be yellow tape, and you would not be able to go on them. And what have happened in Alaska? Exxon's gone across America and said, everything's fine, everything's recovered, everything's back to normal. They lie, okay? Um, so how do you think animals can fare on beaches like that, right? I mean, even the fifth graders get this. I lecture from fifth grade on up. Not so good, right? So we have two-thirds of our species have not fully recovered 21 years later. So here we have this big corporation coming in. We're a fishing community. If the fish runs collapse, which they did, and we still to this day do not have herring um, fisheries, uh, so fishermen to this day are incurring debt still from something that happened 21 years ago. Okay, um, So wreck our lives, wreck our way our economic activity, um, that created a lot of financial uh, stress, which was reflected in the community as dysfunction, individual dysfunction, family dysfunction, community dysfunction. And this is kind of what's playing out across America now with the big, you know, the, uh, the recession slash depression. Uh, Mike Weber, his story, he's the native carver of this. Uh, his story, personal stories told on the side where he lost his family in a divorce and his fishing business um, in a bankruptcy. And this happened all across. This is substance abuse, uh, domestic violence. Um. So Exxon promised to make us whole. So we go to court, which is the way we're all given uh, um, as a tool to get justice, right? We end up, after 20 years of fighting, losing 10 cents on the dollar. That's what we're paid. So. Equal treatment under law, that's what's carved in our Supreme Court building. If we don't have equal treatment under the law, it's, it's a premise, then the whole legal system is invalidated. And the problem here is that these corporations have grown so big at this point that it is impossible for our law to hold them accountable to us, the people. Evidence costs money, just for example. Okay? So what I'm saying, what we learned in Cordova was if it doesn't, if the legal system doesn't work for us, it's not going to work for any of you in any other community either. So what happened? What happened? How, how we realized what? We couldn't wait on the state to fix our problems, the federal government, the political system, the legal system. All these playing fields were tilted. We had to figure this out ourselves. So this is what we came up with. We came up with a little exercise. And what, basically what we have going on in America right now is a clash of values. Okay. This is what this is all boiling down to. In a democracy, 
human values need to count. So what we found in Cordova was to get a, okay, so economy crashed just like October 2008. And the same screaming that I heard around the country when I was on tour with Not One Drop. We need jobs. We need jobs right now. And when we set, asked that in Cordova, we said, wait, can we bring in businesses that match our values? And people were like desperate. People were like, I need to pay my bills. I need to send my kids to school. I can't wait, Ricky. We need to coal mine right now. We need to cut trees right now. And I was like, hang on, hang on, you know. So we eventually got 400 people together, and we came up with this exercise to identify shared values, create a common vision, and take collective action. And it's three very simple questions that are actually posted on ultimatecivics.org, how you actually do this exercise. And we're going to take it to just answer the first question right now. Basically, you ask people the question, and you have a scribe in the group, and then if you hear a value, you say, how many people reflect that? You get hands raised. So you get a prioritized set of values. You get a prioritized vision. You get prioritized action steps. Then you take the steps. So, and what this does is it flips people's in their minds. Instead of fighting each other, what is it that we like? What is it that we like? So we're just going like, to take a, like 30 seconds here and just kind of, what is it that you personally value? What do you like? What do you want your community to look like? So what, so just like kind of off the top, and I do this with fifth graders too, okay, in like three minutes, okay? So, so clean water. Clean water. There we go. Let's just get some ideas coming up here. Talking all the day with the, lots of friends who try to make you stay. Who try to make a what? Try to make you stay and talk longer. Try to make you stay and talk longer. Okay, friends, visiting. That means leisure time. Right? Okay. Clean, clean, clean air, clean water. Diversity. Did I hear? Yeah. Yeah. What? Fairness. Fairness. Social justice. Social justice. Safety. Safety. I saw hugs out on the, on the Red Square today. Free <laughs> hugs. Um, so you're kind of getting the idea, right? We're, okay. We're, we're talking about things that are important to us as, as humans. And I'm going to share with you what um, the kids, I did this with a fifth grade class in Santa Barbara, and I worked it up. Um, this is what the fifth graders in Santa Barbara say. Um, best friends, my mommy and daddy, uh, my home, my cat, dog, or animal, ocean, mountains, water, surfboard, was California, peace, and candy. Okay? <laughs> so when I walk this kid, so here the kids have all these values up, all right? And the idea is, look, you want to go get some candy? You go into a grocery store. It comes with a price. You have to buy it, right? Do your best friends come with a sticker across their head that says how much they're worth? No. Does your mommy or daddy? No. OK, trick question. Does your surfboard? Ooh, yes. So does the act of surfing, in other words, going out and playing with your friends. You know, in Denver, I got instead of surfboard, it was like rock climbing, hiking, you know, skiing, snowboarding. Um, but the point is going out and doing those activities with friends. Does that come with a price? No. So what we do, we th the children work with different types of values. So I'm going to share with you, as I've gone around the country from 2004 on, been in 28 different states kind of doing this much in much more detail than that, okay? Like actually working it out, sitting with groups. But this is kind of the collected data from around the country. Adults are saying affordable homes, living wages, retirement security, affordable health care, safe neighborhoods, quality family time, affordable healthy food, not candy, okay? <laughs> and clean water, air. There's others too, but I mean you get the gist, right? Um, and if we really look at these, which is what we did in Cordova, um, we decided that they fell into types, three general types, economic wealth, social wealth, and environmental wealth. They do this with the kids, too. So all their values ultimately fall into one of these three things. So like peace is social wealth, health, health, healthy people, social wealth. Um, and in Cordova, we began to look at this and we said, well, we like all these things. I mean, our quality family time, that's fishing time with us. 
So we take our young kids out fishing. We couldn't do that after Exxon Valdez. We couldn't do it for four or five years because there was too much oil. So we lost that. We took it to the court. We said, this is one of our lost values. The court said, so sorry, that's non-economic damages, and they threw it out. But for us, it counted. So we in Cordova said, can we do this? This is like mid-1990s now. Can we build an economy that matches our human values, that grows our human values? Can we make our quality of life count? So we decided we're going to mix these three things together. Environmental wealth is, of course, one of the important things, because if you trash the planet, forget community, forget, <clears throat> forget economy, right? Okay, so social wealth is pretty important. That's the community, people working together. And if you get all that, okay, then let's talk economy. We kind of flipped around the priority of, of things, but we decided, could we grow businesses? Could we encourage businesses that increase all these three forms of capital without decreasing the other? Grow one without decreasing two. That became our business model, okay? Ideally, it would be grow three go across and grow three. And author David Corton, who's local here in Bainbridge, right, he uh, describes this as a living economy, this sort of balance of our values and in interweaving for a quality of life. Um, and I actually, w in Cordova, what we came up with was um, we did this model, thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, coal mining, here's our test. Our, and if you do it at the na national level, it's our fossil fuel dependency. Um, you know, environment, what's the idea? What does coal mining do to the environment, right? You guys, right? Okay. Fifth graders all were right on top of this, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and I had given them a lecture about how breathing air actually is making us sick because of the oil that's in it. Uh, scientists' understanding of oil has changed. Oil is much worse for us than we thought in the 1970s. So makes people sick. Anytime you get sick people, eh, thumbs down, right? Um, economy. Okay, thumbs up, but that doesn't meet our goal, right? That's two thumbs down, one thumb up. So in our community, we actually did ecotourism, and that, that works with this model. We did uh, value-added niche marketing on Copper River salmon um, because we only had that fishery. We didn't have the sound fisheries for a while. But the point here is taking this, the fossil fuel picture out uh, further, let's look at the green economy. How does that look with this model? Well doesn't trash the environment, right, if you do it right. I mean, we're not talking uh, wind farm uh, and solar panels across the desert. Um, hopefully, we're doing that on rooftops. So thumbs up there. Um, no toxins in our food because it knocks out the herbicides and the pesticides that are petrochemical based. So thumbs up on health and thumbs up on jobs, right? So we just did it, right? We just met our goal. Three thumbs up by changing, transitioning off fossil fuels. So I say to the six seventh, eighth graders, okay, so what's the problem? How come Congress can't figure this out, right? And I actually had the sixth graders in Denver. I said, what are we going to do with Congress that they can't get something this simple? Thumbs up, thumbs down, what's the issue? And I had a sixth grader shout out, we need to send them back to sixth grade. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Okay, so taking this uh, vision now across America, you know, this, uh, the 28 states, what pe and remember, this was happening under Bush. Okay? People were saying, actually, what's really important to us is passing a livable planet on to our children and grandchildren. People were getting that. That's called sustainable future. That's not necessarily the words they were using. But um, when I take this into Native American communities, um, they laugh because they're like seven generations out, you know? So they call this the well duh principle. <laughs> so um, obviously, we need to pass a livable planet onto the kids. Duh, right? So, how, you know, what else is part of the vision? Well, people were realizing that, um, what, this is 2004, 2005, 6, you know, people were realizing what was coming down from Congress wasn't safe. It's not going to get us to the livable planet. So people were saying, you know what, we need to make our own community more self-reliant, more self-sufficient, better able to withstand shocks. Um, energy shocks, money shocks, and clean, safe energy. That was um, another thing that people were saying. And I ran into, um, from fifth grade, I didn't go much below fifth grade. I tried third grade once. But anyway, that was interesting. Um, 
so uh, the point here is that even fifth graders are working biofuels. They know these words. They know um, tidal. They know solar. They know um, wind. They, they know waste biofuels. My uncle and my daddy are working on a project in our basement, you know. And these are words that I did not know in fourth and fifth grade. And if you take it all the way through the university, we're talking Leeds building, green architecture, green chemistry, you know. It's happening. Where it's not happening is in Congress and, and, and the executive branch. Okay, so how do we get to here? What people are saying is, you know, if we really want regional communities, uh, self-reliant communities, regional food, regional banking, regional energy, green jobs. Okay, and so where do you think the eat locally, eat within 100 miles, eat organic, you know, where was that 15 years ago? It didn't really exist, right? It's, I think it's come out of this with people wanting to pull power back. So one student in Fort Lewis looked at this and he just said kind of in despair, well, that looks great, but how come we can't get there? How come we can't get there? I mean, it's, this is like the send them back to sixth grade thing, right? And the reason we can't get there is because we actually don't have a functioning democracy. Our values do not count. What we have instead is this corporate capitalism. And this corporate capitalism, and even the fifth graders got this right, okay? What are businesses in business to do? Make money. That's it. And that's a Michigan Supreme Court law uh, ruling that came down that corporations exist for the primacy of their shareholders, um, and which has been interpreted to mean make money. So a few other bubbles missing here. The planet's missing here. Um, and really, how we grow our economy now is are things like, besides oil spills, wars, right? No, half of our trade is in arms. Uh, private prisons, uh, making that's growing our economy. Sick people, because we're having to pay for, I mean, if you're sick, you're buying medicine, right? What we're talking about here is our economy grows when money exchanges hands. So there's no value attached. It's simply money exchanging hands. The more money, the better. And it could be for anything. So the problem here is that in corporate capitalism, we grow our gross domestic product, which I think is very appropriately named, gross, <laughs> by consuming social and environmental wealth. And then to get bigger. And then we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, until basically there's nothing left, including the planet. Author David Corton calls this a suicide economy. So it boils down to who rules. Is it our values in a democracy where we can actually get a living, a livable planet to pass on? Or is it corporate capitalism? Is it the corporate values of making money? Is it the suicide economy? And I submit that we're headed you know, that direction at the moment because we do not have a functioning democracy. Um, what we're taught in school still to this day is this beautiful model of you know three branches of government, ch checks and balances, people are the ultimate uh, uh, check and balance. We don't have it. We don't have it. Um, so when I kind of came to this conclusion in writing my second book on the spill about the social trauma, Not One Drop, uh, this one, the last chapter of this book, actually I come to the conclusion that if we're going to fix things like oil spills, we have to get off oil, and to get off oil, we, the people, have to be the ones making the value choices. So to do that, uh, we have to amend the U.S. Constitution to affirm that only human beings have constitutional rights. So what we had was we had, when we started the country with the Constitution, we had um, property, people were property, right? That didn't work, go over so well. And, you know, we had the Howard Zinn quote about people agitating to get rights. And now where we've swung is property is people, legally. And that's not going to work either. So what we need to do is change our, uh, affirm in our Constitution that the 34 times that it mentions persons, it means we, not fake people, not corporate people. Um, and the reason we need to do this is because our past leaders have warned us what would happen if we don't. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the liberty of a democracy is not safe when the people tolerate the growth of a private power to the point where it becomes greater than their democratic state itself. That, in essence, is, do you guys know that? Fascism. Fascism. David? 
And I think actually it's about time for we the people to get a little more comfortable saying the F word. Right? Because the reality is that we are living in a kinder, gentler kind of fascism today. Uh, it's definitely kinder and gentler than other fascisms that have existed. But it's worth pointing out that the, one of the inventors of that term, Benito Mussolini, uh, actually said fascism properly understood. That's just the, we're not in a fire drill. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's the FBI's recording equipment. But Bruce, I like to say I'm hiding right out in the open. <laughs> and if they want to come and get me, they're going to have to do it in front of all y'all. <laughs> That's right. Benito Mussolini said that fascism properly understood should be called corporatism because it is the merger of the nation state with the economic might of our corporations. And he was proud of that fact, right? So I do think that we need to really grapple with the fact that we have merged economics and, and corporations to the point that they are not merely exercising power today. They are ruling us. As surely as kings once ruled their subjects or masters once ruled their slaves, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us. They are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives. They are deciding how much toxics and poisons are in the air that we breathe or the water that we drink. Unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are making the decision about what our transportation choices will be. Will be. They are making the decisions upon what kind of health care choices we'll have available to us. I tell you, they are making the choices about whether this country goes to war or not. That's why we are the campaign to legalize democracy. And I want to be very clear about what it is that we're saying and what it is that we're doing. First and foremost, we take our inspiration from past social movements, the American revolutionaries, the women's suffrage movement, the abolitionist movement, the, free tra the, the trade union movement, civil rights, second wave feminism. You know, those groups of people that took themselves seriously and said, we're not just going to tinker at the margins, but we want and demand systemic changes in the country in which I live, right? And now, today, we applaud all of those movements, and we're taught to, to be proud of those in our history textbooks, and even little kids at least have some semblance of that. But hold on a second and remember that at the time they were doing their work, they were called dangerous un-Americans. They were lit ridiculed and mocked. They were laughed at. They were fought against, spit upon. You know, the elites of the day did everything in their power to squelch every single one of these movements, and that includes mostly the establishment political parties, and it also includes established government who fought against those social movements. And that's why, friends, we are not asking our existing government for a damn thing. We are starting from the idea that we're going to build a social movement ourselves with ordinary Americans like you joining us together, because that's how real social movements think. They don't ask, what can we get out of the existing institutions? Think about it. One way to look at it is, this is the existing political, social, and economic institutions. Here are the existing leaders. Here are the people in, with earned leadership that may not be actually elected, but have influence. How can we use this system to try to get some change? That's where 95% of civic activity and civic engagement happens today. It's where I used to spend virtually all of my time. No wonder I was taught and trained that that was how you actually did it as a lawyer. And I fought like hell, y'all. I really did. I put my heart and soul into trying to get those systems to actually be a little more fair, a little more just, a little more tolerable. And every now and then I'd get a little success. But he, there's a different way to look at it. Instead of saying, here are the institutions that currently exist, what if we said, we're just going to create what we want. We're going to say what it is that we're for. And we're not going to kowtow to those who tell us what we have to accept, but instead we are going to describe what it is, the world that we want to live in, the world that we actually need. If we start there and then we say we're going to encourage other people to join us and your voice adds to mine and it becomes a chorus that is so loud and so powerful, we force them to accommodate us. We don't accommodate them. That's the way a social movement thinks. You with me? Yeah? Isn't that a little more inspirational than to think about, let's lobby for a few less parts per billion? 
By the way, the abolitionists weren't calling for a slavery protection act. <laughs> they had a different mindset. I honestly think it's about time that we as American people got up off our knees and actually had the courage to actually think about what it is that we really value. Because when we go through that exercise together, most of, there'll be differences in ideology, there'll be differences at the margin, but at the core, we basically share the same values. We basically want the same thing. So folks, if that's what we're gonna do, then what is this social movement gonna demand? Well, since the Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the man, we move to amend our Constitution to abolish corporate personhood. Only human beings, not corporations, are entitled to constitutional rights. We also need to establish that money is not speech so that we can actually have appropriate and proper campaign finance laws so we don't allow either corporations or any other entity to actually control the thought process and the electoral process. Frankly, folks, we need to be able to allow local communities to protect themselves, their own economies, like Cordova, like Humboldt, but not only against the control of corporations, but also the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and all these other international conglomerations of concentrated power that are stripping away the sovereignty of the United States government, of the state of Washington, and of local communities. We got some work to do. So, who is the campaign to legalize democracy? Well, here are just some of them. You'll notice that Ricky Bold, the Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County, the group I work with, Ultimate Civics, the group that Ricky works with, but also the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Alliance for Democracy, uh, the Progressive Democrats of America should be up there, the California Student Sustainability Coalition, this is, uh, it's growing and growing, uh, the Detroit Women of Color, uh, the Independent Progressive Politics Network. You know what's awesome, I think, is that these are ordinary people. These are groups across the country, grassroots groups, that actually represent ordinary people. And I want to point out something. There's not a single one of the big national NGOs based in Washington, D.C. that is actually in the steering committee. Now, we welcome their participation, but frankly, folks, I think the kind of visionary thinking that is required today is not going to come out of the nonprofit industrial complex. Right? I mean, the big, big NGOs in Washington, D.C., for the most part, are so wrapped up in this is the existing institution and we can only, like, we can only do what we're told we're allowed to do, you know, and frankly, when we shift the culture so much, they'll come along, you know, when the people lead, the leaders. <laughs> that's how it works. So, and over 60 organizations have endorsed and that number is growing. I think it's actually about 70, 75 now. So that's who we are, but what are we going to do? What's our strategy? First and foremost, you got the mic, why don't you, you want to? I'll do, uh, okay. Normally we go back and forth, but I don't want Mike, I don't want Mike to yell at me, y'all. So we're going we're, uh, we're to just do this uh, and then open it up for a conversation. We understand that local communities are the primary actors, right? Like where you live, work, and play, that's where you have the most power. You don't have the most power pulling a lever for president of the United States or evermore like pushing a black box button. You don't like, you know, that's something, you know, voting for president, but really where you have power is in your local community. And then we move up from the local community to a county level and from the county level to the state and then to the national level. And I do want to point out in Humboldt County, we've already passed a law corporation, that no corporate money in our local elections and corporations cannot claim to be persons with constitutional rights. All right? Now that law got overturned, but we didn't let it stop us in court by the Pacific Legal Foundation, one of these big right-wing uh, corporate, uh, uh, you, if you know the good, I see somebody shaking their head. I was told once, until you get sued by the Pacific Legal Foundation, you're not really doing anything of note or worth to protect the environment. So bring it on, Pacific Legal Foundation. <laughs> and in Alaska, I want you to, I'll do this just because you've got to say this story. All right. In Alaska, uh, about a week and a half ago, a bill was introduced in both the House and the Senate that does not recognize corporate persons for the purposes of elections. So like this is the start, this is sort of like the crack here in the armor. And uh, what we're trying to do is build this up where we get uh, from the communities, enough counties, enough states, half a dozen states maybe that can do this either through change their statute 
or do pass citizen initiative that corporate, we do not recognize corporations as persons in this state. That would force Congress to have to do something. So that's where we're at. And, and it's important to recognize and understand that that model, that the theory or the strategy of social change that we're describing in that document uh, is exactly what the abolitionists did and the women's suffrage movement did and other movements. So collective actions, 4th of July. That's okay. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> Got that. Where I'm from, that means it's a fire drill, and we're all supposed to line up in an orderly fashion and go outside. Fourth of July. Imagine having, uh, a, 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 in, in Humboldt County, we're going to actually uh, do a Fourth of July action where we have a big action at the federal courthouse and say, just as the American, thanks for coming, for the Ameri just as the American revolutionaries declared independence from the illegitimacy of the British Empire and the king and declared their independence from monarchy and the rule of the king, so too does our generation declare our independence from the illegitimacy of the rule by corporations. And we affirm and declare our interdependence on one another and the natural world. And that's just what we're doing. Who knows what your community might do? We also are working on local ordinances and resolutions, and we have templates available for you here and on the website, www.movetoamend. We also are going to move uh, into... Uh, hang on. Uh, Declaration of Independence. I, I like that. Resolution. Oh, oh, pardon me. <laughs> and, you know, I, I went too fast because I want to open it up for questions. Uh, but, you know... Or, ordinances are binding laws, and we did that in Humboldt County and we got sued, but we were okay with it because we used it as a way to politicize the issue. And now, corporate personhood is something every candidate for office actually gets confronted with at candidate forums and so forth. It's really been, like, you, like we didn't lose, we changed the debate. You know, we have forced that into, into political discourse. I don't know of any other locality or jurisdiction in the United States of America where candidates are getting peppered with, what's your position on corporate personhood? Candidate for office for county board of supervisors? Do you think corporations are persons with constitutional rights? We're shifting the culture and the debate. But there's also resolutions. You know, some communities might not actually be emboldened enough to actually pass a law that's going to be challenged in court. If that's the case, pass a resolution like people did around the Patriot Act. That can be a very powerful thing. Resolutions are a statement and an affirmation of values and, and of positions. And by the way, you can do that not just in your local government or county government, but you know the College Greens could pass a resolution. The local labor council could pass a resolution. The Kiwanis Club could pass a resolution against corporate, per, uh, corporate personhood. And you know what? Resolutions can be very powerful. Remember that the Declaration of Independence was a resolution. So big things can come out of resolutions. And then we want to bird dog candidates, really teach people how to do what we're doing in Humboldt County in order to make this a political issue. And lastly, folks, right now you can start getting informed. Democracy study groups, getting together. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom has a brilliant study guide uh, that we link to on our website. Uh, Ultimate Civics has a very simple, profound study guide with PowerPoints and, and different images that are available that you can do. And I want to conclude the idea of study groups. First, um, you know, Betty Friedan, when she wrote The Feminine Mystique, I don't think that she thought she was going to be launching an uh, integral part of second wave feminism and, and a new social movement. I think she was just telling the truth as she saw it and she was pouring her heart uh, into those pages. Uh, that even though I have everything that my society tells me I should have to be happy, I have them all and I'm miserable. And why is that? And she began to deconstruct that story. And, you know, women read that and said, I'm miserable too. And they called their sisters and their aunts and their daughters. And they began to talk to one another about their truth and what they were experiencing. And they began to have study groups on this. And they began, and those study groups evolved to the point that they became consciousness raising groups and occasionally a few men got into the act and and started to go through that process and they changed culture and in one generation y'all my mama worked on the equal rights amendment and although that didn't amend the u.s constitution she's told me about the world that she grew up in and i honestly can't even wrap my head around gender roles in the life that she experienced day in and day out First of all, I can't imagine trying to treat a woman 
today uh, the way my mom, what my mama had to endure and, and go through because all the women I know would not tolerate it for one damn second, right? And the other thing is, and I'm not looking to get patted on the head for this, who would, what man that's worth a damn would want to live in that world? What man would want that kind uh, what, want those kind of gender roles and so forth, right? So I'm the product of a changed culture from one generation to the next. And study groups was a big part of making that happen. And also Thomas Paine, I got to say, called study groups seedbeds of political activism. So like, you know, what they are on the surface is that they're actually going much deeper than that. And they're um, allowing us to articulate what we just told you, to be able to share it with other people. Working through the kitchen table a lot, where you, you might have pop lock, have a pop lock, have people over, uh, download the, the, download a, the uh, PowerPoint show, show it. Um, and uh, that's okay, I won't get too carried away, I promise. Um, anyway, so the point is we need to talk to each other. We need to, we, we need to tell the story, we need to create this is about creating what we want. We need to articulate it. We need to hear ourselves say it. Um, and the final thing that I added, um, I think, um, was about sharing information through social networking. This is like 21st century pamphleteering. Um, so, you know, get it out on your Facebook. Move to amend.org. Go there. Get your friends um, um, excited about this. Signed up. Um, and, oh, activating your campus. I just want to get this part uh, up for the students. Um, whoops, not that. Uh, this is the number two here. We're actually having a training for trainers for youth organizers in Eureka on April 3rd and 4th. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, we've got van loads of kids coming up from uh, San Diego, Santa Barbara, over from Chico, um, down from Linfield. And I just talked to some of uh, the Washburg uh, uh, students on campus today, so that might actually be happening from here as well. So. Um, this is about activating our youth. There's our contact information, and now we are good for questions.